Welcome to McCormick and one of the talks that we call Conversations at the Intersection. So today we have two people I have known for a number of years. Bill Baker, who is a structural engineer, and Inigo Manglano Ovalle, who is an artist. And these two people have collaborated on and off. Uh, Bill Baker is someone who has had projects like the Millennium Bridge, uh, two things like the Burj Khalifa. He was with Adrian Smith, the person who designed what is now the tallest building in the world. And he's a member of the National Academy. He's someone who thrives on the guts of engineering. But nevertheless, he has had an ongoing relationship with Inigo, who is an artist, and we have talked in the past, or I have mentioned in the past, that um, the function of science is to make the unfamiliar familiar, uh, things that to people who are not trained, they look disconnected. You have a way of seeing what connects those things. But one of the ways to see art is to make be strange things or make things that look familiar unfamiliar. And I think I wouldn't try to characterize what Inigo does in a couple of sentences, but you will see that he can pick something that you thought you knew and suddenly looks completely different, is someone who has had his work exhibited at the Art Institute in Chicago, at the Whitney, and at the Guggenheim, okay? So the idea of bringing them together, and they will kind of go back and forth, is to put into evidence how one world can be enriched by being open to ideas coming from the other side, and some people like Bill and Inigo thrive in this back and forth. So with that being said, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, I think so. Inigo is gonna lead us off here, all right? I will, hold on a second. Okay, this is on, I guess. All right, so uh, thank you, Julio, for inviting us. You know, Bill, and I go back a bit, and we have periodic conversations, and now that I moved up to Evanston, sometimes, sometimes we meet for coffee at, um, what is it, Brothers <coughs> Cafe? Down on Main Street, yeah. Right, or, or we go to uh, South Evanston and, and meet at my uh, house and studio. Um, but we thought today um, we'd, um, there, is that better? <laughs> We thought today we'd just sort of like continue, I mean, reminisce about a project that we worked on. Uh, Bill and I have, since we met, have worked on numerous projects. We're going to concentrate on, on one and on a topic that's a favorite of both uh, artists and I think engineers. It's just gravity, right? So like if you're a sculptor, gravity is one of your topics, right? But if you're a poet, gravity is also one of your topics. And if you're a filmmaker, gravity is one of your topics. So the different definitions of gravity will come in, into play, as well as being the title for a work that we'll talk about. Um, and, uh, and so uh, I have collaborated with architects and engineers and scientists throughout uh, my career. And so, you know, um, and a number of them I think of as uh, artists and philosophers. And one of them is swinging on this image uh, from his own work. So it's Bucky Fuller uh, swinging inside one of his geodesic uh, domes, right? And so it's a good gravity image uh, to begin with. do you think, Bill? Yes, you know, and uh, you know, one of the things about being an engineer who works uh, with artists is the whole thing about uh, uh, disruption? Uh, you know, artists are great at disruption. Okay, getting us off, getting us off the track, 
and, and, and doing something, something different. And so, um, you know, this was, um, you know, we kind of like, uh, you know, uh, this, this project we're going to talk about, uh, Indigo had, had already had it up and going a little bit and then looking around. And then as it got, uh, started getting traction, mm -hmm. uh, then we, we got involved and then started collaborating on it. And it's really, uh, and it is all about gravity. Right. So the project uh, starts with uh, some key figures, some historical figures. So it's actually kind of an investigation into modernism and modernity. Um, I'm looking at Mies van der Rohe. Um, I'm thinking of Sergei Eisenstein, the director, right, whose father was an architect and who almost went to architecture mm -hmm. and who has some really unbelievable essays on architectural space and how, to, how architecture actually functions, not as image, not as structure, but it's kind of a phenomenological space. <clears throat> and as you look at this photograph, uh, the uh, window washer is the man next to me. Right. Okay. So this is, this is uh, the first of many projects that I've done at uh, Mies van der Rohe uh, projects and sites. And it began in, in 2000 when I was commissioned by the Whitney to do a piece that I called Le Baiser or The Kiss and which uh, uh, I was invited by, back then, the Farnsworth Foundation to do an intervention at the Farnsworth House. Most of their artistic interventions are phot photography or film-based. You're, you're not allowed to touch anything at Mises Farnsworth House. So you negotiate the place in booties, and people open the doors. There's one little closet, which is the public bathroom in the house, which you are allowed to actually open and, and use. And so I couldn't touch the space. And so after a number of months of trying to figure out how I would intervene, I saw the window washer. And he comes every other week to wash the windows outside and every other week to wash the windows inside. And so I asked if I could hire him as a technical assistant in the film, if he would hire me as a technical assistant as a window washer. So I went there as his employee and did a performance of washing over and over and over again uh, Mies van der Rohe's house. Now, now, this particular house by, by the Farnsworth house, the architect and engineer who was working for Mies was Myron Goldsmith, who later became a partner at SOM, and he was my mentor. And so for about a dozen years, I taught with Myron down at IIT with the, with the graduate students in architecture. And I once asked Myron how he sized the windows on the Farnsworth house. Mm -hmm. And what he did, he walked down Michigan Avenue to, to pass these car dealerships. Mm -hmm. These car dealerships had these big plate glass windows, so we went in and asked him how thick was the glass. And that was the engineering of the glass for the Farnsworth house. <laughs> so Myron Goldsmith is a key figure, right? An engineer and an architect. And the person that made possible the structural aspects of Mises buildings. So we have Myron Goldsmith, we have Mies van der Rohe, we have Sergei Eisenstein, and, um, and then Yevgeny Zamyatin, little known um, so Soviet, back then Soviet author, underground author, uh, probably the first science fiction writer. And we'll try to tie them all in together. So anyway, this is the first Mies project. We got me started thinking about these buildings as uh, places to investigate, to intervene, or to do critical practice. And I came along uh, in my studies to this piece that was unbuilt by Mies, a proposal for a house called 50 by 50. Why 50 by 50? Is there a 50 foot by 50 foot? So, so there was a, there's a whole series of different houses that uh, Mies studied, and Myron worked on them for Mies. And so there were 2,500 square foot houses. 55 by 50. And sometimes the columns are in the corner and sometimes in the middle. And, right. and, and so you, you chose one with the column in the middle. Column in the middle. And I loved it because its other name was called the house with four columns. Very simple. The house with four columns. And uh, it was designed by Mies and he worked together with Myron Goldsmith and, and it was never produced. You know, it was meant to be a modular house but it was never, never produced. There were some engineering problems uh, with it. And then my idea was to create that house 
uh, but to reduce it to 25 by 25 and sort of make it kind of a studio apartment and drop it in front of the Seagram's Plaza in New York City on Park Avenue in front of Mises Building. And we had all the funding. In fact, all the funding was coming from the then owner of that property, Seagram's Plaza. And at the last minute, the funding was pulled. And, uh, and all the work that I had done uh, in terms of fabricate, uh, drawings for fabrication and possibilities kind of were put to rest and archived. And I don't know, how do we mean? Well, uh, the, uh, there was an architect at SOM, Colin Franzen, who was, who, who was uh, Inigo's assistant. And he uh, and helped you with the iceberg at the Art Institute that was displayed at the Art Institute. And, and so uh, we got together, and this came, came back. And, and the first thing that I thought of when uh, uh, Inigo approached me about this project, to help him on this project, was this uh, uh, collage. Uh, that was, it was in the, uh, Myron Goldsmith used to live up here in Wilmette, over, up on Central Street. And this was in his foyer. When you, when you, whenever you entered his house, you would see this. This, amazingly, this amazing double cantilever roof with a, with a locomotive hanging from it, OK? And, and, and this top detail, which I did not recognize, I did not pick up. But I mean, every time I looked at that, I said, I don't know how that works, but Myron wouldn't show it if it didn't work, OK? So, uh, so then, um, uh, so, so this, this, was, this was, was the challenge to how do you do that? How do you do that in a thing that's stable? And, 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 I, and a little um, uh, foreshadowing here, I actually got it different. I, got, I, I couldn't remember exactly what he did, and so I did what I thought he did, but I did something completely different to solve the same problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then the issue was, immediately the issue was always for me whether it was still buildable in terms of en engineering-wise, and how could an artist build it within budget, right? How could I build this within budget, with the limited amount of funds that uh, public art funds or artistic spaces had? And always the problem was that corner, and that corner, and the other corner, and the other corner. The corners were the problem. Because when you look at this, you think about it. I, I've got four teeter-totters. You know, each of these are like a T, and they want a teeter-totter over. And so, uh, so this is a very, very interesting engineering problem, uh, like how do you restrain that thing from falling over. And Myron did it one way, which I, I, you know, I didn't realize until after we'd actually built the thing. And we were working on the catalog for the exhibition where it shows, and I look at it, oh, I got that right. <laughs> I got a different solution. OK, uh, next. So, so, so uh, here's the, here's the uh, structural uh, conceptual design phase of the project. What you see there is my kitchen table, and that's plastic um, picnic uh, silverware, OK? So I, I have a series of knives that are taped together. We were renovating our house. We had all this blue tape that you have when you're doing renovation. So I, I tape these together, and, I, and so I have four T's that are connected together. And it's very soft, because each one wants to rotate. Uh, it's OK under symmetrical loads. If it's, it's balanced, it's fine. But under unbalanced load, it's not. And, and so what happens is, as it, wants to, as it wants to roll, this corner wants to go down. The next corner wants to go up, uh, the far corner wants to go down, and the next corner wants to go up, and you're back to where you started. And in order for that to happen, the roof has to go rhomboidal. So the solution was to put a knife, another, you know, some silverware across the diagonal. And, and by making the roof diaphragm rigid, you stabilize this, this, this instability, which is in a totally different plane. And one of the great things about working with somebody like Bill is that when we're meeting at the office and he's demonstrating this to me, I'm just getting off on the silverware and the blue tape. <laughs> and I'm going like, wow, this is like an unbelievable sculpture, you know? I mean, I should take that and try to do something with that, you know? Um, should we advance? Sure. OK. So, 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 uh, so here's the sketches. Uh, you can see how, as it uh, under this anti, uh, this uh, anti-symmetrical loading, the way it rolls, and as the if you look at the roof plan there, you yep okay up on the top. 
Okay, if you look here, you know, uh, this point's going down, up, down, up, and as that happens, this roof has to go rhomboidal. And so if you somehow create a diaphragm, it can no longer go rhomboidal, and then it was stable. I'm not sure how, if Myron actually quite solved that on this house, because here, this is Myron's sketch for when he was working for Mies. I think the, uh, on that uh, one in the, the roof, um, the one with the locomotive hanging from, I think he solved it a different way. Uh, this is uh, about Mies and diagonals, but uh, when Mies was dead when the, when the one with the locomotive did, so, uh, or at least he wasn't involved. Uh, uh, he actually had uh, girders going, connecting the top of the columns and cantilevers coming off of those. That's how he did it. So, because you might remember in Myron's sketch, he had a pin at the top, where I put the pin at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's always mo more than one way to skin a cat, and I always find that uh, miscommunication is a great way to get to creativity. Uh, you, you know, when you when you when you when you uh, uh, like when I collaborate with somebody and I try to explain my idea and they don't quite understand what I'm saying, but they try to repeat it back and it's different than what I actually said, mm -hmm. and better. Mm -hmm. That you know, the, the, you you end up with some place different than where you where where mm -hmm. you where you started. Yeah, and I remember this sketch is actually pretty important for me because um, this one by Myron Goldsmith, because I actually had handled that piece of paper about eight years or nine years prior to that when I was uh, working with uh, Phyllis Lambert in uh, the Mies in America show that started off at the Whitney, and we were going through the MoMA archives and handling every bit of drawings by Mies, and some of the pieces were also Myron Goldsmith. And so uh, this piece was kind of resurrected. I had also done a little bit of research um, and, and knew that Myron had proposed a kind of diagonal coffer, right? He knew to his mind. He proposed to himself, I may be able to solve this with a diagonal coffer rather than one that's going at right angles, right? Okay, and, but he also never mentioned it to Mies because he knew that Mies, you know, would just throw a fit because Mies was against diagonals. And so Myron never, so the piece, in a sense for them, never got built, except Myron Goldsmith would then later go on and say, look, this piece never got built, not because we couldn't solve the engineering problems according to Miesian principles of aesthetics, but because it was originally meant as a modular home for a family of four. And the problem was, how does a family of four live in a glass house, <laughs> right? With no walls, right? And so the engineering was not structural in terms of failure, it was structural in terms of social, right? And maybe perhaps even personal, right? I'm always amazed when people use the word structural in all kinds of ways that are not about engineering. Right. <laughs> Anyway, so, so this is the, the, uh, the sizes, you know, these are small members, uh, 8 inch, 12 inch members. Uh, you know, here's, here's this roof plane, so you got, you know, these uh, 6 inch channels. And one of the things, uh, we looked at the detailing of the Farnsworth house, you know, the, the, you, you, can get, you can get your hands on the drawings of how they were done. And so I would, I would, I would propose these purely Miesian details to Inigo, and he said, no, 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 let's do something different. So it's, it looks like Mies, but the detailing is, each one was a reinterpretation, and, and, and kind of, I'd say kind of purposely not purely Mies. Yeah, there was a kind of a referencing, a definitely quoting Mies, definitely referencing Mies, but the appropriation and, in a sense, the appropriation went to the extent that there was, as an artist, there was license to actually change a few things. And then of course we do our, our usual engineering thing and, and so even under very unbalanced snow loads the corner only me moves about three-eighths of an inch, a little less than three-eighths of an inch. So you know this thing locks it up. The, this, this system, this roof diaphragm locks it up so it doesn't move much under, you know, under unbalanced loads like a, a snow drift or something like that. And then of course you know uh, working very closely together <laughs> Okay, for the engineers, uh, this is so much more satisfying than our normal buildings, okay, because, you, you know, oops, what did I do? Just click that one again. Uh, okay, normally, okay, we, we make drawing specifications, it goes out for bid, uh, you know, you can't get involved in the construction because that's uh, means and methods, your insurance doesn't cover it, all that kind of stuff, okay, so it's like, like this hands-off distance. But this isn't construction, this is an art installation. 
Okay, so you, so you get into means and methods, and, and you know, the whole thing, like you get, you get down to everything, okay? And so here, we had to figure out how to make it work, how to build it, how, how can you actually ship it, and, 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 and how can you do it with field bolting, because you, you don't want to weld in the sh on the site, you want to do shop welding, field bolting, and, and it has to be shippable, and work with all this thing. So, you know, there's a whole lot of back and forth, a whole lot. Of, and so would you really talk, you think this guy's an artist, he's actually a design build contractor, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I have been working for many years with fabricators out in New York and California, and my fabricators out in California doing massive, rapid prototype sort of clouds based on scientific data, stuff that I could never do in the studio. But when I wanted to work with this and to work with Bill, we had to find a fabricator in Chicago. We wanted both to go from each office or studio and meet at the fabricator. Yeah, that's when you were living on the west side of Chicago, and you were really close to the fabricators. Yeah, it was like six blocks from them. And uh, so um, I would ride my bike over, and Bill would drive his Alfa Romero, right? And uh, we'd meet there uh, with the fabricators, and they became part of the design. We actually, uh, the construction um, drawings would go to them, they'd respond, they'd come back, and so the dialogue was, uh, I mean, it included many. Yeah, so vector fabricators, they're really good. I mean, they're art artists in themselves. Yeah. So, you know, we have uh, these drawings that are with great colors, and I guess they deal with things that I have no idea about, right? <laughs> no idea. And in the meantime, I'm making these kind of drawings that, that for me kind of express this house kind of falling apart, almost kind of like a, I'm thinking of kind of almost like in Wizard of Oz, where the house lands back, right? And it comes, you know, gets taken up and then come, comes back. But I, I want to build the house upside down, right? So now we have another problem. How does the floor become the ceiling? The ceiling become the floor, right? And so this is a, and, and I'm interested in this thing here called the glass house, oops. Um, this title, well, because I'm interested in, in this house also being a film. And um, I'm thinking about Sergei Eisenstein. So here you see a still from his uh, film Battleship Potemkin, okay? And uh, this is a great sort of uh, scene, also all about gravity. This is the baby cradle sort of falling, uh, of, you know, just tumbling down uh, the stairwell during uh, during the riots in in in, uh, in, in that film. Sergei Eisenstein had uh, read this underground author uh, by the name of Yevgeny Zamyatin, and he had published a novel called We, and We was a dystopic novel. It was about dystopia, and in this novel, for example. All architecture and all structures were made of glass, right? Everything was transparent, and everybody could see everybody at all times. And all the poets were mathematicians, and the protagonist was an engineer, and he was building a glass rocket to blast off and colonize another world with this dystopic vision, right? He wrote this in 1921, and it passed around in Soviet Union underground uh, uh, mimeographs. And it f uh, finally was printed in Hungary. And when George Orwell read it, he did a review for it in the London Times and said that Aldous Huxley's Brave New World was a complete plagiarization of Yevgeny Zamyatin's We. So you have Mies, the utopian glass house, and you have Evgeny Zamyatin, the dystopian sci-fi novel. And Sergei Eisenstein was um, debuting Potemkin in Berlin when he came across an exhibition of what he called paper architecture. Theoretical architecture could only exist on paper, and he came across this image of Mies van der Rohe's a glass apartment building in Frederikstrasse. Now he made the connection. Now he wants to do Zamiatin's We, but he wants to call it the glass house. 
and these are some of his, <coughs> some of uh, Sergei Eisenstein's notes um, uh, explaining, uh, for example, here, uh, the waterfall under the house and the kitchen flowed. So these are glass rooms. For example, here's an apartment building, and this is a bathroom. Okay, here's a toilet, and you can see a couple dancing in the floor below, right? So he's developing scenes for a glass uh, production. And this is in English now because he has now moved to America, and he has received a contract from Paramount, and now he wants to take We, which was a critical uh, a film about the Soviet, uh, uh, the Soviet Union, and he is now making it into a critique of American culture, right? And it, so he's making these sketches to talk to engineers about building the sets. Again, uh, from Battleship Potemkin, one gravity shot, a sailor falling off the boat and getting cut, uh, caught on the rope boat, and then from uh, Eisenstein's uh, uh, film called Strike. And then this is an image having to do with then the piece that we finally build called uh, Gravity is a Force to be Reckoned With, with the title of the structure and the film uh, inside the house. And uh, this is obviously an upside, well it isn't obvious, this is either she's adhered to the ceiling or the photograph is upside down. But in reality, the house is upside down, and she, this actress is doing a performance during the installation of this piece. Bill. So here we are at Vector Fabrication. Let's go back to the, and so, uh, Inigo, you're in there somewhere. You can tell by the, I'm the, I'm the guy with no hair here. Uh, maybe me with less hair. Okay, oh, there you are, there was over there. And uh, a, a Northwestern graduate, uh, Alex Beghini, uh, uh, was was the main project engineer on this. So see, Alex is probably in there somewhere. I don't I don't see him. Uh, anyway, so uh, you know we, we we engineered it, fabricated, pre-assembled it to make sure it fit. Okay, you always want to find these things out before you get to the job site. And uh, and so this is uh, the the construction. Right. And the key thing that we wanted to see during this visit, Bill, is we wanted to make sure we wanted to measure this deflection. We still hadn't put the diaphragm, hadn't been built, but we still wanted to see as built the deflection, see if we were running into problems. Yeah, because you don't, you don't want the glass to hold up your house. Uh, anyway, so, um, so then it gets shipped to, uh, to, uh, to Mass, it was displayed at Mass Mocha in, in uh, Western uh, Massachusetts. And so uh, the, uh, the general contractor next to me is having it assembled here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> No, this is, uh, so right now basically what you're doing is seeing components of those drawings. All the drawings that Bill has showed you, uh, uh, both uh, the ones that you drew out in pen and pencil and the ones on a monitor are now being realized and, and shipped. This is the diaphragm, right Bill? And uh, you'll see later that these plates here will uh, connect all the pieces of wood and then uh, there will be plywood on either side, and that will create the diaphragm. Um, and um, so this one is put together. It comes in two parts and is bolted together, and then it's raised up. And then the structure that uh, surrounds it of many different components, the actual visible structure, uh, is then sort of just wheeled slowly underneath uh, the diaphragm and then uh, for the diaphragm to be lowered onto the, uh, onto the structure itself, right? And uh, so everything has to be uh, leveled uh, for footing from the beginning and throughout the process until the diaphragm is actually in place and actually uh, with its wood, right? And then we can release uh, all the levels. Nico, you can talk a little bit about that. So. Yeah, so, so, so here you, you see it coming together with the, uh, with the, um, you know, the purlins being put in and then the, the, the diaphragms. It's actually beautiful. I mean, just, just as an object, obviously. I mean, yeah, we could have stopped here, right? Yeah, there's a lot of and intellectual And we would have had the sculpture. 
uh, you, you know, and I think the supports were then moved back in because we, we, we didn't want the supports to be seen, you know, so there was the, the whole build deal of how, how do we hold it off the floor but not, not overly visible. And, um, you know, being assembled inside. Now, so here's the, the beautiful millwork going in. Of course, it's attached to, and, and our, one of the biggest problems is nomenclature. We keep on saying it's on the ceiling, which is actually the floor, okay? So, uh, you know, we kept on using the wrong word. Okay, it's on the ceiling. I mean the floor. I mean the ceiling. <laughs> there is a place. There is a place in which, uh, in the gallery, this is a huge gallery, in which you can actually have a vantage point above the ceiling. So all of a sudden we had to worry about what the roof was, right? So 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 here it is. It's finished. So you want to. So um, on one level, it's just a very elegant, high modernist glass glass cube. Uh, it's upside down. Uh, it, the core, all the partition walls, there's one core element and one partition wall, and they're all based on the Farnsworth house. Okay? And uh, then the furniture is all Mesian, and it's adhered to the ceiling, which is actually uh, the floor. And uh, in the ceiling, you also have, uh, well, on the table, you have rolls of tape, sketches, and the door is slightly ajar. In other words, someone uh, has left, right? Someone occupies it. So this suddenly transfers, it becomes um, not a house for a family of four, but maybe perhaps a house for one individual, right? An individual that is absent, right? And then, um, and the house is also a speaker. Uh, let's see, oh, wrong buttons. Right here and here are two sort of speakers adhered to the glass. And so the film that is happening in the building gets transmitted onto the glass of the house and the glass becomes the speaker for the whole building. And then the film, which was an attempt to recreate or create Sergei Eisenstein's The Glass House, which he never did uh, in a house which Mies van der Rohe never built, um, um, in a sense, um, was reduced um, to a series of about 32 phone calls, video phone calls, that take about 90 minutes to, uh, to occur with gaps between them. Uh, so uh, in a sense, it's a feature-length film that plays off an iPhone. Uh, here you see a copy of We uh, tucked into Mies van, van der Rohe's Barcelona daybed, which is floating in the ceiling. So this would have been sort of like the sleeping area of the individual who is absent. Right? And then there is in the kitchen a coffee pot with grounds, a, a freshly brewed grounds, a French press, and then and a coffee mug also in the kitchen. And on this small glass table is a sketchbook that's left behind, some notes that are left behind, an ashtray with a cigarette, and ashes inside, and a phone. And the phone rings. And then messages are left by three characters. And the three characters are the best friend of the protagonist, the poet who's a mathematician, because all poets are mathematicians in this dystopia, or all mathematicians are poets, right? An authority figure that surveys and monitors the engineer because he's acting a little weird, you know? He may be being pulled in by the opposition and the opposition, right? The rebellious, the seductress that tries to sort of turn the engineer into the opposition force, right? And whose attempt will be to blow up the glass rocket that he himself has designed and is building. And the phone rings, and if you're at one end of the gallery, you hear it, you look for the phone, and you find it. Maybe you hear it, hear the message, you haven't found the phone, message is over. Three minutes later, another phone call. Five minutes later, another phone call. A minute later, another phone call. 
and basically the film stretches. And the only character that's missing is the protagonist. And then the only thing, let's see what else here. Oh, okay, so drawings of the, I found these. Anyway, so just, just the whole thing, this whole realization of, of uh, this intellectual overlay with the physics and the, mm -hmm. and, and, and the, the corporal nature of what we're actually building and how, how it all comes together. But you know, one thing I liked about Bill's uh, drawing here, which is basically a working drawing, this is a construction drawing. Um, it's telling us how to lay out all the, the wood spans. But in the next building over is Sal Lewitt's uh, installation of a hundred wall drawings, many of which are grids with diagonals and lines just like this, right? So when I decided to roof the piece, I wanted to use this corrugated roofing, mostly because you could see it from a window in a gallery that held a solid width that was almost identical to the roof, both in scale and in drawing. And then there's this box that is left behind that everybody during the opening kept saying, hey, you guys, left the box up there, right? But if you listen to the messages, there's a box that's always referred to because it's got a package and in that package is something and that something is gonna be used perhaps to blow up the rocket, we don't know. And so it's this unidentified package that's left, right? And the box itself looks like an existing box but it was actually designed so it actually is the actual proportion of the original 50 by 50. So there's a model of Mises 50 by 50 in a box and nobody knows what's in there, only the artists. The curators do not know, didn't know for a full year what was in there. We're not allowed to go in and check it out. And then underneath the phone crashes the coffee cup. The only thing that falls to gravity is a coffee cup that breaks on that beautiful white floor, right? And then eventually during the installation, a fly gets in the room and lands to take a little drink of coffee and, 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 and sort of, uh, yeah, dies there. Because it wasn't really coffee. It was just some concoction made to look like coffee. You know, and then it comes down to the detailing, you know? And what, 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 you know, uh, me said God is in the details. Okay, and so uh, we spent a lot of time um, trying to figure out what is the non-Mesian Mesian detail we, we could do to, 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 how do you turn the corner? Uh, you, know, every, you know, one of the most important problems in architecture, believe it or not, is how do you turn the corner? And, and normally it's a, it's, a, it's a corner, a horizontal corner, but here, you know, it's, this is a, a, a vertical edge corner. And, and how, did, how did we change this at the, at the bottom, which is actually the roof, which is upside down? Yeah, yeah. The, I think what what part here is totally unnecessary. I think it's this one, right? Um, I that? can't remember at the moment. I'd have to think about. It, but yeah. I, so th this is a case in point where the engineer is actually making aesthetic decisions and inserting something that has nothing to do with this. Uh, yeah, that's actual possibility because it's not the main load path. Yeah. 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 But I like this this corner a lot, and I. I had nothing to do with it. At some point, I just said, well, we don't have to be Miesian. Why don't we be bakering, right? Why don't we be, do something a la baker? OK, and so I'm going to play one of the phone calls, right? This is the seductress, and she's talking to the protagonist that is not answering the phone. Nobody knows where he is. And she's worried about whether he's actually going to go through with the project. Let's see if this plays out. Do we have sound? No. It's time. You said not to call you. I know how frustrated you get when I repeat how critical the timing is. You get when I repeat. Ready? Hit it loud and then you can hear it. You hear it? It's time. You said not to call you. I know how frustrated you get when I repeat how critical the timing is. But I just had this funny feeling that everything had stood still just now, and that it all just stopped. 
And well, I, I wondered if you felt the same thing. And I thought, you know how when you're moving at a constant rate and you don't feel you're moving because it's constant? Then suddenly something subtle happens out of the field of perception. A small distraction that goes away as soon as you sense it. Well, sometimes that very thing could be an earthquake and you won't feel it because it's the size of a wrinkle on the corner of your eye. A wrinkle that wasn't there last time you checked in the mirror, but will be there next time. Well, when I just now imagined that everything stood still, it felt like an earthquake. I mean, I started to shake. I was suddenly afraid that something was off. That's why I called, to see if you felt the same thing. Anyway, I'm glad you haven't picked up. You must be on your way. You'll be there soon, I'm sure. What was I thinking? So she hangs up. Um, so all the dialogue are based on these characters from the novel, but they're also based on some notes that Einstein always did because he, he changed some characters. He had this great character I never used, which was a clown um, that, an Indo no, it was not a, yeah, he described it as a clown, but in the movie it was not, he wasn't dressed as a clown. He was an individual who could not survive, who wanted people to look at him. And so in the buildings, when he com was confronted with people walking around, he would bang him s his head on the glass to try to get people's attention, right? And nobody would pay attention to him, right? But her dialogue about the earthquake and the constant, to me, was really important because we were actually designing this house to eventually be installed permanently outside. So we were always talking about wind levels and uh, seismic levels and so forth. And, this is, uh, and eventually uh, we found um, a, a collector, uh, contact Inigo, who happened to be in, um, the collector was in Korea. And so uh, we, uh, we needed to make it you know, more site specific. And so we started looking at that. And so uh, Inigo uh, you know, asked us if we could suggest a Korean uh, architect who could work with us. And so happened, the guy we selected studied under Myron Goldsmith and worked at Mies van der Rohe's office. And was for, a, for, a part, for a short while was an interim dean at IIT. And, so, and, he, and uh, most amazingly, he'd actually seen this. He had been to Mass Mocha and had seen the, the installation. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, this kind of this continually uh, flowing of connections and interconnections. And so he's a... Uh, He's, he's a man in his years. He has a practice that started in the United States and now is in Seoul, and he's very well respected. Um, but he was also, you know, going to Mass Mocha yes. to see the exhibitions. In fact, he was going to see Saul Lewitt, and he happened upon this piece here. And so I like this image because it talks about how one circulates around the building. Uh, because I often, in many cases, think that the building is totally static. It has been frozen, and the only thing that moves is the public around it. And uh, I was reading essays by Sergei Eisenstein when he talked about architecture and talked about this experience of architecture, right, was one of the experience, is the experience of the individual engaging, passing through it. And, uh, he used his writings on architecture to really inform the way he would control his cameras on a film set, right? And so the public here becomes the dolly and the pan, and they engage with the house that is a film and the film that is a house. And then, so this, this is, apart from the house, this is the only other artwork that's produced as part of this piece. It's a large photograph, and the photograph is always hung upside down, right, Bill? So, you know, I think we'll stop there, right? Okay. Thank you. And we'll take um, any questions that you have. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, the Farnsworth House is, you know, it's, it's not very far away. Um, well, it's probably about an hour and a half from here. Uh, so go see the Farnsworth House. We recently actually, the SOM partners, design partners got together. There was, um, uh, you know, the architectural design partners, uh, structural engineering design partners, and uh, 
uh, urban planners. We all met together. And it's, uh, the first time we met was in uh, Phil, uh, Philip Johnson's glass house in Connecticut. And about a month ago, we met in, at the Farnsworth house. Mm -hmm. So talk about uh, the philosophy of a firm and, 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 and what, is it, what is the aesthetic, of the, the ethos of the firm that, that holds us together. So it's definitely worth a visit to, uh, to the Farnsworth. levels as opposite corners, to our higher, to our lower. Because if it's in one plane, yeah. when it deflects, you know, the shortening is second order small. It only restrains the, the warping into anticlastic surface after final deflection. Uh, yeah, the, um, you know, the issue was, um, it is kind of a second order effect. You know, the, you know, so, so each, as each of the, the, the teeter-totters tries to roll, uh, you know, you get, a, you get a first order vertical displacement, and then, then the rhomboidal, you might say, is second order. Uh, you know, the, the fact that the roof wants to become a rhomboid. Uh, but it was really quite effective, you know. Just, just the, uh, could you have made it, like, more triangulated within the roof plane, perhaps? But, you know, th but that's a fairly uh, thin roof. There's not much vertical dimension change across that in the depth of that top, that top channel there. Uh, by the way, that's Alex's professor. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so why didn't Mies like triangles, and, and how did you, what was the calculus in deciding that you would use triangles? Um, why did Mies not like um, diagonals, do you know? I have no idea. You know, I have, I've done maybe 10 Mies projects. I've washed windows at the Farnsworth House. I've done 24-hour performances at the Neue National Gallery in Berlin. I've done an installation about, uh, about uh, immigration in the Barcelona Pavilion. And so I have this kind of kind of love-hate relationship with Mies. And so I don't, I, d I don't understand it. I mean, I think it basically, he, he really liked, he, he liked this simplicity. He didn't want to overcomplicate uh, anything. That's not to say that his work is not complicated in any way, and his buildings are not ex extremely complex. But he, like myself, was also, I think, in, interested in the power of kind of reducing things to essential elements. And so the diagonal for him was something that you would, I just, I don't think I've come across it anywhere. You know, I mean, he designed every plaza and platform that his buildings were in, and he designed every quadrant. The size of the tra uh, travertine at the Farnsworth house is very specific to the grid and how it lays out and where the seam meets something else, you know. On the other hand, I was recruited when Rem Koolhaas, uh proposed his design at IIT that would sort of touch or incorporate into the uh, Mises building, you know, to the creation of a new student union at IIT. Um, all, all these architect friends of mine called me up and said, Inigo, you have to sit in this panel discussion. We have to protect Mises building. And I said, what are you talking about? It is living architecture and contemporary architecture should engage with it, even directly. And so they quickly they found out that I would have actually sat on the opposite side. So sometimes Mies will do it this way, and they take somebody like Kuhlhaus to come in and bring in the diagonal, right? Sort of intervene, kind of so make the disruption, as, as Bill said, you know, how, how uh, you know, interject something to just deflect it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, what's true, it's a question that really wouldn't be asked except for he had an engineer who knew how to solve the problem if he could use the diagonal that you would never see, never see. But so it's a question that really wouldn't be posed ever 
but I only bring it up because it's the moment in which uh, the structural engineer sees a solution. And the solution is very elegant. And the solution will not shift anything whatsoever, and yet it's not permissible because it doesn't fall in with either uh, an aesthetic or maybe perhaps an ideology. Uh, I still try to figure out what Mises' ideology is. He's very slippery in that sense, you know. So at one point you said, um, you know, you had this idea and then you decided you wanted to flip it. Uh, but I don't recall much in the way of the rationale behind the flipping. So could you tell us the rest? About that? Yeah, I knew that would come. It's basically, um, it, it, on, on one level, it's, you know, it's the idea of something that actually falls, right? And whether, you know, is it, you know, what's going to fall? Is it going to be the side of the toast with the jelly on it? Or is it going to be, you know, is the jelly going to hit the floor? Or is it going to land the way it should? And then, of course, it is a nod to another modernist. So it's a nod to Duchamp. It's a nod to the urinal, right? Because the house is already made, in a sense. It's already made, and so it's the Duchamp urinal twisted on its side, right? Um, and it's also then, to me, in a way, kind of a reference to something that is so elegant and so, I mean, so static and so thought out, both Mises' design and my appropriation of it and Bill's engineering of it, and fabrication, that there had to be some alteration some some disruption to nod towards um, the dystopic sort of elements of Zamiatin's novel, right? You know, and that's also why the box exists on the top, right? If the box exists, because basically it's saying there's a grand illusion, right? It's a grand illusion that everything's okay, and yet here's this one problem. Or it might be, oh, there's a box, you left it, something's wrong, and yet we are safe, right? So remember, this is happening, this whole project is happening for me from 2003 to 2009, right? So I'm dealing with a dystopic environment, which is our environment post 9-11, and I'm dealing with the dystopic sort of a, uh, social uh, organizations and constructions by a number of administrations. And I'm dealing just as uh, Zergi Eisenstein or we Zamiatin was dealing with an insertion of a kind of paranoia or fear within, uh, within contemporary society, except I present it very quietly. Well, one of the pieces that uh, Inigo designed in that period is the uh, bulletproof umbrella. But basically, he took an umbrella, which is an incredible structure. You know, when you think about an umbrella, it's just amazing structure. You have this fabric, which you have these very, very thin compression members that don't buckle because they exist in a, in a sea of tension. You know, amazing structures. And so what he did is he, he made it, instead of uh, nylon, it's Kevlar, so that you can protect yourselves from the elements in the, in the post-9-11 uh, world, so you can have a Kevlar, a bulletproof umbrella, to protect yourself from the elements. Uh, and, and so uh, we're actually talking now about trying to do a piece where, and, and we haven't quite figured this out, uh, either an extension of that or, or we're doing a lot of research in shell theory right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to present to Inigo all our research in, in shells that we've been doing lately and see if that inspires him to come up with some perhaps uh, new piece. So mm -hmm. we'll see where it goes. Mm -hmm. Now uh, we have also talked quite a bit about <clears throat> Uh, the uh, Northwestern University, particularly the uh, Lakeville, as a canvas, uh, you know, where perhaps we might do something, you know, with the engineering department and the art department mm -hmm. together. And, and we, 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 this is what we talk about when we, when we meet for coffee right. uh, down at, at Brothers Coffee House is, you know, what, what can we do that would, that would be both engineering and art and, and could display both groups, but do it, do it in a very public manner. That's a challenge for you, Julio. <laughs> so I, uh, 
Many people think that the beauty of structure engineering uh, lies in efficiency yeah. of structures. Mm -hmm. so efficient structures are beautiful. In my view. Yeah. Now, uh, if we reject diagonals, we are forced to build something uh, that's flexible and it can only be resisted by bending stiffness and torsional stiffness and rigidity. Mm -hmm. And if this, this square uh, frame uh, on the top and on the bottom of your house were, of course, perfectly rigid in bending and in torsion, which is expensive to produce, then it will be still safe even without the diagonals. Mm -hmm. but it, uh, yeah, it's of course, yeah. expensive. But, uh, but you know, part of it is, is the whole thing about trying to get the most, you know, the, the most efficient is usually the stiffest, you know. You're, you're storing less energy. So, you know, so we actually went to the diagonalization rather than using, try to do it with torsional stiffness or flexural things. So we got a lot less de uh, deflection. If we had tried to resist this basically with the weak axis bending of that column, we would have gotten very large motions. And we wouldn't have, you know, we'd have, you'd have to box it out or something in order to make it work. Uh, just, you know, because that, the only thing that would be keeping, this upside down one's kind of giving me, but anyway, uh, you know, fr from rolling would be the flex, the weak axis flexural uh, stiffness of the, uh, of the columns. And so, um, uh, so, you know, so we, we tried to do that. Now, one of the, uh, this is, this is an art piece, it's, it's, uh, it's an art piece of architecture, but when you get an architecture, in a nor uh, like a normal f uh, functional building, one of the most interesting conversations to have amongst the design team is how do you tell the story of the building? And, and how, do you, how do you express the structure? And so I say the structure is the story of the building. And, and the next time you look at the base of the Hancock building downtown, you'll see that it's a very impure structural solution in order to tell the story of structures. The, uh, the, the, the corner resolves itself, you know, the vertical, the big horizontal, the big diagonal, resolve themselves one story in the air. Why would you do that? You want to carry the load of the foundations. But if you, if, but if you did that, if you do the purely structural solution where you took that down to the, the, to the uh, foundations, you know, no one would understand how the building worked. It would just disappear into the pavement. You'd have this you know, diagonal disappearing in the basement. This, you know, and you would never see it resolved. So what the design team did, you know, Foz and, and Bruce and those guys, they resolved it one story in the air. And if you look through the retail windows at ground level, you'll see a diagonal that is still not hidden but not expressed that's carrying the load down to the basement. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, this whole thing about, and so sometimes we used to say, say sometimes you have to lie to tell the truth. Okay, then we decide, well, that sounded a little harsh. So now we say sometimes you have to distort to make clear. And, and, and so, you know, the, this whole thing where, where, you, where, you, where what is the story you're trying to tell? And sometimes you have to distort the, the purity of your solution to make, this, make it clear. And, and that's an example. Yeah, and I think that's also a place that where art and engineering, in this case, might coincide. This idea of you have to tell the lie to tell the truth. The fact that sometimes a, a novel will tell you more about your condition than a, a treatise, a sociological or economic treatise, right? And that, uh, and that in often cases, artists admittedly, right? Admittedly so, uh, are liars, but liars for a purpose, right? So I, I'm really interested in this times when these things uh, uh, coincide. And those, I may not understand the physics and the structural mathematics that you're talking about, but when I can sit with a scientist or an engineer, and then all of a sudden a, uh, have a dialogue that slides from science, hard science, right, into poetics, or s slides from uh, engineering into philosophy, you know, and then, you know, and obviously one of the places where we all meet is, is in the politics, right, which is that one site in which we're continually trying to determine efficiency and we keep running into the fact that we, right, uh, are the most inefficient sort of beings in the world, right? And, uh, and that life, in a sense, wants, you know, ruptures and collisions continuously, 
you know. There was a question here, this young man. Can you repeat that question? For, for which buildings? We saw the things that like Sapman and Drem, like the American Beauty exhibition in Berlin, the, the drawings that inspired the film that we did in Oh, um, so, so what, what were the, it, the thing that, uh, that uh, was it, uh, uh, I just signed the, the projects he saw in Berlin, the unbuilt show, the paper architecture. The theory. Right. Do you know what, the, what those were, what, what those projects were? Oh, yeah. The, well, the one image that I showed you was, I think, in 1927, drawing by Mies van der Rohe, same architect, uh, in 1927, while he was building brick villas, right? Okay, he was not doing anything in steel and glass, but he was imagining a glass skyscraper, and he was imagining it in Berlin on one of the main thoroughfares called Frederikstrasse. So the drawing does, it exists, that one drawing, and the exhibition uh, had a, a number of his drawings as well as a number of European architects um, that were developing theoretical drawings, right? So it was, it, it was yeah. around the, the time of this very famous magazine called uh, G. So you can, you can find this building and uh, other, uh, other. Now the thing is that that building or buildings like that have been built now. They exist. You know, you see them all over the place. But Mies, um, Mies took almost 50 years for him to build the first um, glass uh, apartment building, right? Which is right on Lakeshore Drive, 640, 680 uh, Lakeshore Drive. So that was the first, in a sense, steel and glass uh, uh, apartment building by, I think, any architect, you know. You know, a lot of the, the theoretical studies you see then, uh, you know, if you took them literally, a lot of times they're not buildable per se, but that's just because they haven't gone through the, the process, you know. Uh, I got um, asked to do a, a lecture on Frank Lloyd Wright's Mile High Tower, and so I studied his drawings, and basically what his proposal, if you tried to build his proposal, it wouldn't quite work. There's a few technical things that would have not worked, okay? But, you know, it would have been, um, you know, you, you could essentially uh, maintain the essence of the idea and correct those technical issues uh, and, and not lose the idea. And so a lot of these things, you know, on these, uh, a lot of these things, until you really get into the details, I mean, uh, you might say uh, this didn't change at all from his little tiny model, but it changed completely from that little tiny model, but the essence was always there, mm -hmm. you know, a, 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 as, as you, as you, uh, resolve the, the technology or the constructability or the cost or, you know, all these things mm -hmm. come into art as well as they do into, into everything we do.